Hello and welcome to another Calc video. In this one we're going to be looking at some three-dimensional volume uh, in section 6.2. That is the disk and the washer methods. Let me back up here one slideshow the assignment for this section. Uh, in the textbook, page 425, we've got a couple problems there. Uh, there are four questions on everybody's second favorite website, WebAssign. And I also have a worksheet here for you. So three parts to the homework assignment here. So let's see here, we got some bullet points. Find the volume of a solid using the disk method. Find the volume of a solid of revolution with the washer method. Find the volume of a solid with known cross sections. All right, let's dive in. It says we've already learned that area is only one of the many applications of the definite integral. Another important application is uh, its use in finding the volume of a 3D solid. In this section, we will study a particular type of three-dimensional solid, one whose cross-sections are similar. Solids of revolution are used commonly in engineering and manufacturing. Some examples are axles, funnels, pills, bottles, and pistons. Here they've got some uh, shapes below, and notice each of these have a line running through it. That is the axis of rotation. And what we are going to do is just take a radius and rotate it around that axis to create these shapes. Okay. So when a region in the plane is revolved about a line, the resulting solid is a solid of revolution, and the line is called the axis of revolution. Uh, usually it's the x or the y axis, but it doesn't have to be. The simplest such solid is a right circular cylinder or a disk, which is formed by revolving a rectangle about an axis adjacent to one side of the rectangle, as shown here in the figure. So here in the figure, this is our representative rectangle. It's got width w, and they're using R here sort of like the radius, you know, because we are going to spin this around this axis of revolution. So as that spins around, it's going to kind of look like this picture below, and we are going to create a disk as that uh, radius spins around the axis. Um, and here again, we're creating a disk because one side of our representative rectangle is touching our axis of revolution. So when we spin it around, there will be no hole left in the middle of our disk. Uh, the volume of the disk is the area of the disk times the width of it. Well, the area of our circle is pi r squared, and we multiply that by the w, the width of the disk. Capital R is the radius, w is the width. To see how to use uh, the volume of a disk to find the volume of a general solid of revolution, consider a solid of revolution formed by revolving the plane, re uh, the plane region in the figure 6.14 above about the indicated axis, as shown on the next page over here. To determine the volume of the solid, consider the representative rectangle in the plane region. When this rectangle is revolved about the axis of revolution, it generates a representative disk whose volume is dv, or uh, delta volume, is pi r squared times delta x. Approximating the volume of the solid of n such disks of width delta x and radius r of x sub i produces, you know, here's the volume of our solid, back to the summation stuff. We're going to sum up all our rectangles, and here's our pi r squared times dx. We can factor the pi out and go from there. Uh, now, this approximation appears to become better as we let the norm approach zero or let n approach infinity. We would have infinitely many disks. Each disk would be infinitely fin thin. So we could change our summation notation into definite integral notation. So here's our volume of our solid. We're going to let the norm go to zero of our summation of all these disks. Well, let's just turn that into a definite integral. Pi is out front, our integral from A to B. We have our radius here, quantity squared, with a dx differential to know we are integrating with respect to the x-axis. Schematically, the disk method looks like this. Remember, we would take a known pre-calculus formula, volume of a disk, pi r squared w. We would figure out the representative element, one of our representative disks, disks in this case, Delta V is pi r x sub i squared times delta x. And we use that known formula and the representative element to calcify it up. And we have this new integration formula. A solid of revolution is volume is 
pi times the integral from a to b, r of x quantity squared times dx. Uh, we will have a similar formula derived if our axis of revolution is vertical, or the y-axis. And we'll see that before too long. So again, here is our representative element in this flat plane region. And our axis of rotation is the x-axis, so we're going to spin that around. So what we have over here, this sort of light tan disk or uh, square rectangle that I'm blocking off in red, that's this part here that gets rotated around. And again, we could come up with a model where we do one, two, three, four, five, six disks. Um, each disk would have a, a proc or the same width, or we could let that uh, n go to infinity. Infinitely many disks, all infinitely thin, and we no longer have an estimate. We have the exact volume of the disk. All right, here's a side-by-side, -side, uh, depending on if your axis of rotation is horizontal or vertical. So the book says to find the volume of a solid of revolution with the disk method, use one of the formulas below. And let's just go through these with their picture at the same time. Notice here to the left of the red line, here's our representative element in the plane. Notice that it is perpendicular to the x-axis. So that means we will be integrating with respect to x. Our upper and lower limits will come from the x-axis. Everything will deal with x. And if we look up here at the formula, we'll see that. Volume is v. Uh, we have our pi outside. We'll uh, integrate from a to b. And here is our function r of x quantity squared dx. The a and the b come from the x-axis. So if we look down here at the picture again, we're starting our integration at a and we're going to b. So the a and the b came from the x-axis. Our function here, r of x, is written in terms of the x variable and we have a dx differential. So everything is coming from the axis that we are perpendicular to. Let's go over and look at the vertical axis of rotation. Formula is very similar. Volume is pi is factored out front. Now they're using c and d because now these are numbers from the y-axis. We start at c and go up to d. Notice our function now is r of y. So our function ha should have y variables in it, no more x's. And then here we have a dy differential. Again, notice in the picture we are perpendicular to the y-axis. So that means everything is going to come from the y-axis, the upper and lower limits, our function, with a dy differential at the end. Oh, and we get to do one, finally. All right. Find the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region bounded by the graph of root of sine x about the x-axis, or below the x, or the function above the x-axis. We're going to check out that from 0 to pi, and we're going to rotate around the x-axis. So let's, here's the graph is what's going on. There's our root of sine wave. It's kind of like the sine wave, uh, but a little more sort of flattened out oval shaped. We want to find, uh, we're going to take that and rotate it around the x-axis, so it's going to come out in like an egg shape, and we want to find the exact volume of that egg. So because this is new, I'm just going to write out the formula in its entirety. Volume equals pi times the integral from a to b of r of x quantity squared dx. All right, well, we can get most of this info from the uh, picture or the uh, setup in the text up here. So we've got our pi, and we've got our integral symbol. And notice here we're going from 0 to pi, and we can also see that in the graph. We're starting at the origin, and we're going here to pi. So there's our lower 0, upper pi. Now in here, I'm going to put some brackets in squared, we need to put in what determines the height of our representative element. So if we look here, what is touching the top of our representative rectangle? Well, that's our function, the root of sine x. And then what's touching the bottom of it is 0. So I could write root of sine x um, and then minus 0 quantity squared, but you know the minus 0 is not going to do anything, so we can just make that the root of sine quantity squared, and I'm going to put a dx on there. All right, we are set up and ready to go. But first, did you notice we have a square and a square root? 
they are inverses. They are going to cancel each other out. So this square and the square root are going to cancel each other out. So now we have our volume is pi times the integral from 0 to pi of just the sine of x dx. Okay, let's anti-derive and use a little fundamental theorem of calculus. So this pi, of course, is going to come along for the ride. Now the antiderivative of sine is negative cos of x. And we will evaluate that from 0 to pi. So I like to save this pi out here till the very, very end. So there's a pi. And now here in these brackets, we'll do our fundamental theorem. Upper limit, pi jumps in. So that's going to be the negative cosine of pi minus lower limits going to jump in minus the negative cos of zero and there we go so let's see um, cosine at pi well that's a negative one but don't forget we still got this negative out here that's going to come along this minus the negative, that'll turn into a plus. And the cosine at 0, well, that's just equal to 1. So minus the negative, that is a 1 plus a 1. Last I checked, that was 2. And remember, we still have this pi out here. So that's going to be 2 pi. Final answer. The exact volume of that egg-shaped rotational solid is pi. And I just noticed when I looked in my notes, yeah, before I just had this part up here. So there is our uh, plane region, our flat two-dimensional representation. As we spin that sort of golden-colored rectangle around the x-axis, that's going to create our disks. And all those disks together will form this egg shape. Uh, exact volume is 2 pi. Ooh, now this is a good one. Uh, we're going to rotate around a line that is not one of the coordinate axes. So the, the book says find the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region bounded by the graphs of 2 minus x squared. That's a downward opening parabola. And g of x, our other function is just y equals 1. Uh, or no, yeah, our other function is 1. And we're going to rotate ar around the line y equals 1 as shown here in the figure. So here is our line y equals 1 up here. Notice this blue rotational arrow shows that is what's getting rotated. And again, we are not touching the x-axis in this case. Okay, a couple things we got to figure out. We need to know where we start this integration here and when we end. Now, it is real obvious in the picture here that we're starting at negative 1 and ending at positive 1. Sometimes you can't really trust the graph. Um, remember, you can always just set our two functions equal. If I set 2 minus x squared equal to 1, I would add x squared to the other side. I would subtract 1 from each side, so x squared is 1. And if we take the root, we get plus and minus 1. And that does just verify what we think we see here in the graph. We will uh, begin and end our integration at negative 1 and 1. So um, I, actually I'm going to start down here setting up the integral. So we know we're going to go from negative 1 to 1. Oops, get out of the way there. And I almost forgot there should be a pi out front. I did not leave enough room for my pi. There it is, pi. And now what we want to do is put in here our r of x and square it. This is our radius that is rotated around our rotational axis. So this is the height of our rectangle. Let me hit this rectangle up here in red ink. There we go. And the height of that rectangle is what is touching the top minus what is touching the bottom. So for r, r of x, what's touching the top of it is the 2 minus x squared function. And then we're going to subtract what's touching the bottom. The bottom of that red rectangle is touching the line y equals 1. So our, rot or, uh, excuse me, our radius, our r of x, 2 minus 1 is 1, so that becomes a 1 minus x squared.
So that's the radius that we're going to rotate around. So that's going to go down here inside of these black brackets. 1 minus x squared goes in there. And we'll give it a dx differential. Let's see. Um, if we try to u sub this, our inner function's derivative t would be a negative 2x. We could give it a negative 2, but the x is nowhere to be seen. We're missing the most important part. So we're not going to be able to do this by u substitution. Let's do a little algebra and foil it out. 1 minus x squared quantity squared is going to be 1 minus 2x squared plus x to the fourth, and it gets a dx. So it looks like we'll just be anti-deriving this with a simple power rule and then evaluating. So let's see here. We're going to keep our pi out front. And then x anti or 1 anti-derives to an x minus raise the power by 1 and divide by the new power and raise the power by 1 and divide by the new power. And we will evaluate from negative 1 to 1. Ones are always nice to work with, especially when you have cubes and fifth powers in your function. So here's our pi. And I'll do uh, the blue bracket stuff will be the upper limit. So the 1 jumps in. We're going to have a 1 minus 2 thirds plus 1 fifth. And the fundamental theorem says we're going to subtract. And now our negative 1 jumps in. Be careful with the exponents. So when the negative 1 jumps in here, that'll just be a negative 1. When we put the negative 1 in for x cubed and we cube it, a negative will escape and turn this to a plus. So that's going to be a plus 2 thirds. And then the negative 1 jumps in here to the fifth power because it's an odd exponent. The negative will escape. So that's a minus 1 fifth. Oop, hold the phone. I just noticed up here this is a plus. So this should be a plus also. Um, okay, now let's distribute that red negative and see what terms we can collect together. It up there. So let's see. Don't forget we got this pi lurking out here. And then we've got a 1 minus 2 thirds plus a fifth. That's an ugly 5. Distribute here. That'll be a plus 1. Distribute minus 2 thirds. Distribute minus 1 fifth. So let's see. Right off the bat, it looks like those 1 fifths are going to cancel because we got a negative and a positive. They cancel out. So we still got this pi out here. And then we've got this one plus this one. That's equal to 2. And we've got a negative 2 thirds and another negative 2 thirds. That's a negative 4 thirds, or 1 and a third. Oh, and you're going to have to forgive me. Let me back up a little bit here. Those 1 fifths should not have canceled. Uh, when I go back through my notes, in the original it would have been a plus. But then we put in a negative 1. So this one up here should have been a negative. And then when we distribute that negative, then this one would be a positive. There we go. I apologize. So let's get back to the work here. So we've got 1 plus 1. That's a 2. We've got a fifth plus another fifth. That is plus a 2 fifths. And then we've got a negative 2 thirds and another negative 2 thirds. That's a minus 4 thirds. Uh, there we go. Uh, that's a 2 over 1. Get the common denominator 15. Let me erase up here and work my way back up. So if we give everything a common denominator of 15, 2 would be 30 over 15. Uh, for this one, multiply top and the bottom by 3. 6 fifteenths minus multiply this one by 5 over 5. 20 fifteenths. And if we check out all those numerators, we're going to get 16 
fifteenths when we add and subtract them all. Fifteen sixteenths pi. Uh, and that would be cubic units of some sort. All right, now we have the disk method, and the disk method is solid because our representative rectangle is touching the axis of rotation. Uh, but what if our rectangle is not touching the axis of rotation? When we rotate it, we will have a hole in the middle, creating a washer. So the disk method can be extended to cover solids of revolution with holes by replacing a representative disk with a representative washer. The washer is formed by revolving a rectangle about an axis as shown in the figure. If lowercase r and capital R are the inner and outer radii of the washer and w is the width of the washer, then that volume of that washer is going to be pi times capital R squared, outer radius squared, minus lowercase r, inner radius squared, times the width w. To see how this, vol or this concept can be applied to find the volume of a solid, consider the region bounded by an outer radius, capital R of X, and an inner radius, lowercase, uh, as shown down here in the figure. If the f uh, region is revolved about the axis, the volume of the resulting solid will be a washer. So here, we have lowercase r, that is our distance away from the axis of revolution. That is touching the, or that is the bottom of our representative rectangle. And then over here we have capital R is the touching the height, or the top of our representative rectangle. And then imagine we're going to spin that around the x-axis. And because we're not touching here, we will have that will be like a hole in the donut. So it's going to look something like that. As we rotate it around the axis, we'll have our outer radius. That will be the edge of the disk. The inner radius carves out the hole in the middle of our disk. And here is what that is going to look like set up as an integral. Of course, we have our pi factored outside. Definite integral from A to B. And this is outer radius squared. Outer radius squared minus inner radius squared, inner radius, outer radius squared minus inner radius squared, anti-derive with respect to, in this case, the x-axis. Uh, note that the integral involved, uh, involving the inner radius uh, represents the volume of the whole, and it is subtracted from the integral of the outer radius. So here we've got kind of this odd shape. The outer radius is again touching the top of that representative element. Inner radius is touching the bottom. When you spin that around, we have in this case a solid revolution. Kind of looks like a funnel. All right. So in uh, example three, we're going to use the washer method. It says to find the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region bounded by these graphs. y equals the root of x and y equals x squared. We're going to rotate them about the x-axis as shown over here. Uh, first, I did delete out those two boxes, so which function is which? Uh, remember, x squared, that is a parabola opening up, so that looks like we're starting here and we're opening up. So it's probably a pretty good guess that the one on the bottom is x squared. And then think about the old square root graph. We start at the origin, and we go up and over, and we start to level out. So our other one is the root of x. So I guess we could write, oop, I need a pen. There we go. Our outer radius is capital R of x. And that is root x. Our inner radius, or lowercase r of x, is x squared. OK. Now remember, we're not going to do it like this. We're not going to do outer radius minus inner radius and quantity square that. That's not what's happening here. We're doing these each independently. Outer radius squared minus inner radius squared. So again, here's our blank formula. Volume equals pi. We're going to integrate from A to B. And we're going to have capital R of x squared minus lowercase r of x, also squared, 
dx. So let's start plugging some stuff in there. Oops. And we can see here our point is 1, 1. So we are going to go from 0 to 1 on the x-axis. 0 to 1. So we've got our pi. 0 to 1 on our int. That looks like a 6. 0 to 1 on our x-axis. And then in here, our outer radius. Remember, that is the root of x minus, and our inner radius, that was the x squared function, dx. So we need a little more algebra to sort of clean this up, make it look a little prettier before we anti-derive. So we've still got our pi, 0 to 1. See, the square root of x quantity squared, square and square root cancel, so that's just an x minus x squared, quantity squared, is x to the fourth, dx. All right, we're almost there. We've done a lot of work, and notice that none of this yet has been calculus. We're setting things up. We're using a lot of algebra, but no calculus yet. Well, here it comes. So we're going to anti-derive, keep the pi. Remember, that comes along for the ride. x anti-derives to x squared over 2 minus x to the fourth becomes x to the fifth over 5. And we will evaluate from 0 to 1. So the 1 goes in first. We're going to have 1 squared over 2 minus 1 to the fifth over 5. And then minus, plug in our zeros, 0 squared over 2 minus 0 to the fifth over 5. So those zeros are just going to wash out. They don't mean anything. We can just back up and go right there. So what do we have here? Now when your numerators are 1s, what we can do is subtract our, y or our denominators. 5 minus 2 is 3. And then if we multiply them, 2 times 5 is 10. 3 tenths, and don't forget your pi. 3 tenths pi is our volume of that solid. All right, let's see what example 4 has. Uh, integrating with respect to the y-axis, look at a picture. Notice that our representative rectangles are now horizontal. They are perpendicular to the y-axis. And if we see this little icon down here, that is also our axis of rotation. So we are perpendicular to our axis of rotation. And in this case, that's the y-axis. Now, since we're going to the y-axis, that means everything will have to be in terms of y. And notice here, our function is not in terms of y. It's in terms of x, x squared plus 1. So what we're going to have to do is solve that for uh, x. So we'll start by subtracting 1. Um, so I'm going to move it over here. That's going to be y minus 1 is equal to x squared. And then when you take the square root, you're going to get x equals the root of y minus 1. And I guess since we're here in the first quadrant, we'll assume it's the positive root of y minus 1. So let me get this out of the way. And if we look at the picture, it looks like we're going to have to set up two integrals. Imagine we're starting down here, and as we work our way up, we're going to do what touches the right side of our rectangle, which is this line, x is 1. And uh, the left side of it is touching 0. Now that's going to be true until we get up to here. Once we get beyond y is 1, the right end of our uh, representative rectangle is still touching here, but now the inside is touching our function. So we are going to have to set up two integrals on this one. Um, our outer radius looks like positive 1. So this is our outer for all cases. Um, when it comes to the inner radius, we're going to have different ones. We're going to have one radius from 0 to 1, and then we'll have a different one from 1 to 2. So this is going to require two integral setup. 
So let's see, let's, I'll do my first one here in red ink. That'll be down here. We're going to do this bottom part. So our uh, integral, we're going to have a pi out front. And remember now we're going to get all our numbers from the y-axis. So we're going to start here at 0, and we're going to go here to 1. 0 to 1. And now in here, we're going to do outer radius squared minus inner radius squared. The outer radius, what touches the right end of our rectangle, is 1 minus our inner radius is what's touching the left side of that rectangle. That is going to be 0 squared. So there's our first integral. Uh, and we need a dy because we are now perpendicular to the y-axis. So the red integral is going to find the area of that stuff I sort of boxed off there in red. Now let me get this out of the way. I'm going to have to erase this so I have a little more room. So now we need to set up another integral to find this blue volume when we do our rotation. So here we could put our plus here, or we could put it down here. We're going to need another integral. So that one's going to have a pi. And now our numbers on uh, the upper and lower bounds. Uh, lower bound is 1. Upper bound is 2. So this will be evaluated from 1 to 2. And now we have outer radius squared. And the outer radius is the same as the other one. We're touching that line. X is 1. So that just becomes a 1 minus inner radius squared. Now what's touching the left side of our representative rectangle right here? Well that's the function that we solve for and I erased. That's the root of y minus 1. Root y minus 1. And that also gets its own dy. Okay. I'm going to rewrite this down here below in black ink. So let's see, up here in the red stuff, we've got a pi and an integral from 0 to 1. And then that's just 1 squared minus 0 squared. So that just turns into a 1 dy. 1 dy. Now the stuff down here in blue, we've got a plus and a pi and an integral from 1 to 2. Now here our outer radius squared is going to be 1 squared or 1 minus. Now here, the square and the square root are going to cancel, but be careful. The radical was a grouping symbol, and when we eliminate the radical, the y minus 1 under it should still be grouped. And that also gets a dy. Okay, getting a lot of work, but no calculus yet. We're getting close. I'm just going to do one more step here before we can... Uh, uh, anti-derive. We'll keep this the same. Pi integrated 0 to 1 of 1 dy plus pi times the integral from 1 to 2. When we distribute this negative, we're going to have a minus y and a plus 1. And since we've already got a 1, let's add those up. And we can make that 2 minus y dy. Okay, I think we're actually ready to do some calculus. Hallelujah. Get that out of there. So the first one, I'll go back to red ink. We've got this pi. And we'll anti-derive 1 with respect to y. That's y from 0 to 1. Plus, uh, we got a pi here. And when we anti-derive here, we'll get a 2y minus y squared over 2 y squared over 2. And we'll close that one off and evaluate that from 1 to 2. So back to the red stuff. Upper limit 1 is going to jump in right there. So that's going to be 1 times pi, or pi. And we could do minus 0 times pi, or we'll just leave that there just as pi. Now we're on the other side plus here, and we've got this pi outside the brackets. Let's let our upper limit jump in first, so this 2 is going to jump in here. 2 times 2 is 4, minus 2 jumps into the y squared, so that's uh, 2 squared or 4 over 2, which is 2. So there's our upper limit. Now we're going to minus our lower limit. So the 1 jumps in, 2 times 1 is 2, 
and the one jumps in here, minus one squared over two is a half. All right, so we've got this red pi plus this pi. Now let's see, this four minus two is two. And then we're gonna have another minus two. Another minus two, and that'll t distribute there, and that'll be a plus one half. So let's see, in these black brackets, two minus two is zero. So we've got a half times this pi. So this pi, we'll bring along pi, plus now we've got another half pi. How many pi's do we have? One and a half, or three halves pi. And keep in mind that would be some kind of cubic unit. Since we're looking at volume here for the first time, we're gonna have some kind of cubic units. What's next? Oops. I thought, where's example five? Okay, I had to pause the video there and find uh, example five from another slideshow. I can't believe I didn't have it in this one. Uh, so now this applied problem. Uh, we've got a manufacturer. They're drilling hole through the center of a metal sphere like a ball bearing uh, of radius five inches. So the ball bearing has a radius of five inches. Uh, we're going to drill a hole through it with a radius of three. What is the volume of the resulting metal ring? Now we can't just take the volume of a sphere and subtract the volume of a cylinder because we would not have, you know, the sort of edge, the, uh, the rounded edge of that cylinder when we cut it out, we'd be assuming that was straight. We'd get a good estimate going that way, but it would not be exact. And let me make this picture a little bigger so we can get a better look at it. So we can see here the x-axis is running right through the ball bearing. We have a three inch diameter uh, hole cut through it and the, di or the diameter of the uh, sphere itself, the radius of the sphere is five inches. So let me slide this up here a little bit. What we're gonna do is figure out our representative element in here, and then we're gonna spin that around the x-axis. So here's what's touching the bottom. When that goes around, that will be the hole in the middle of the ball bearing. And then what's touching the top will be our outer radius, and that will go around and be the outer edge of this uh, thing that we're creating. So, and I kind of sort of spoiled the surprise here. Um, we do want to solve this down to y equals. So let's see, what do we have here? We've got a circle. What is the equation of a circle of radius five? x squared plus y squared equals radius squared. And our radius here is a five. So let's make that five squared or 25. All right. Let's uh, solve this and get y by itself. So step one, subtract the 25, or excuse me, subtract x squared. And now we're gonna take the square root. So y equals the root of 25 minus x squared. And again, from based on our picture, we're up in the first and second quadrants where our y values are positive. So don't put a plus minus on there. We're just gonna deal with the positive of those. Now to figure out our uh, upper and lower limits, we could, if the picture is good enough, look at the picture, and it sure looks like here we could get the negative and positive four by looking at the picture. Uh, the way to do that uh, algebraically, we could just take this equation here, our circle, and we're gonna do, set our y equal to three. Oops, cause that, you know, here's our line here at the bottom here, that's y equals three. So let's plug in three for y and see what x is. So x squared plus three squared equals 25. Subtract nine, x squared is 16. When you take the root of that, you will get plus and minus four. And the picture backs that up. So we will start accumulating volume at negative four and we'll work our way along until we get to positive four. So again, picture could do it, but in this case, a little uh, extra algebra is not gonna hurt anything. So let's see here, let's identify inner and outer radius. So the outer 
radius is what's touching the top of the rectangle, and that's our radical, 25 minus x squared. And the inner radius is what is touching the bottom of that rectangle, and that's just a simple uh, 3. Remember, our inner would be the lowercase r of x. The outer is the capital R of x. So let's put these into a definite integral setup and see where they take us. So our volume is going to equal pi, and we will integrate from, we already figured out, negative 4 to 4. And now we're going to do our outer radius squared minus inner radius squared, and we'll have a dx on there. Now our outer is the radical, 25 minus x squared. Uh, the inner is 3, 3 quantity squared. So let's see what happens. We've still got our pi, negative 4 to 4. So in the first set of brackets, the square and the square root will cancel. We're going to have 25 minus x squared. And then when we square this 3, we're going to have minus 9. So the 25 minus 9, that's 16 minus x squared. And we'll put a dx on there. All right, a lot of work, but we are now ready for a little calculus. So a little power rule going on here. 16 will anti-derive to 16x minus x to the third over 3, evaluated from negative 4 to 4. So there's our pi. And then the upper limit jumps in. 16 times 4 is 64. And then minus uh, 4 times 4 times 4 is also 64, but this is over 3. So there's our upper limit. And now we're going to minus our lower limit. So now the negative 4 jumps in there, so that's going to be a negative 64. And the negative 4 is going to jump in there. When we cube it, it's going to be a negative 64, and that negative is going to hit that and turn it to a plus 64 thirds. Okay. So let's distribute our negative and add them up. So here's pi, and we're going to do 64 minus 64 thirds, that's supposed to be a 3. Distribute the negative here, that's a plus 64 now, and a minus 64 thirds. So let's see, I like to work with my whole numbers first. 64 and 64 is a buck 28. And then we're going to have a negative 64 thirds and another one of those, so that's a negative 128 thirds. Uh, if you get a common denominator, I might as well just finish this off up here. Um, 128 is 384 thirds minus 128 thirds, and that's equal to 256 thirds. And don't forget to bring along the pi. Well, there we go. 256 pi divided by 3 uh, is the volume of our ball bearing with a hole cut through it. Okay, now to wrap this section up, we're going to look at another way to find a solid, but this one we're not doing rotations. If I go back here a little few slides, um, when we rotated these, you know, if we slice them, everything's going to be round in some way, shape, or form. You know, this bottle shape, if we cut it this way, all the cross sections will be round. Same thing with this pill-looking thing, the funnel, all of it. When you look at cross sections, all the cross sections are round because we're rotating a radius around an axis of rotation. Another way to find a volume is with known cross sections. Again, we've done cross sections that were all round, but our cross sections can be any geometric shape. Triangles, squares, rectangles, it doesn't matter. So with the disk method, we can find the volume of a solid having circular cross sections whose area is pi r squared. 
This method can be generalized to solids of any shape as long as you know the formula for an uh, uh, arbitrary cross-section. Some common cross-sections are squares, rectangles, triangles, semicircles, and trapezoids. Now the formula here in the box, they are deceptively simple. Um, for cross-sections of area A of X taken perpendicular to the X-axis, our volume will be integral from A to B, A and B come from the X-axis, A of X, DX. If we go to the Y-axis, our upper and lower limits are now C and D, those numbers come from the Y-axis, and our formula is A of Y times DY. Uh, the way I like to explain these when you're in class, imagine, you know, here is, I'm going to sort of draw it at an angle. Here's your desktop. And let's say I give you a function like a parabola opening up. So here's the x and the y axis, and we've got a parabola opening up. Now, again, imagine this is all on your flat desk. If we use cross sections that are triangles, you know, the distance between the sides of the parabola will be the base of the triangle, and then that triangle will grow up out of your desk. Down here by the origin, we'll have a tiny little base and a tiny little triangle, and as the uh, parabola spreads open, way up here we'd have a very big base and a very big triangle. And instead, we don't have to use triangles, we could do semicircles. Here is our base, and then we'd have a semicircle on top. Down here, we'd have a base, semicircle on top. So here, our cross sections are going to be different geometric formulas. So in example six, we're just going to look at, I believe this one, we just do a triangular. Um, and then we'll do, I got a great one of these we'll do in class with multiple shapes all on the same base. So in example six, they're asking us to find the volume of the solid shown here in the figure. The base of the solid is a region bounded by these lines. Uh, negative x over two plus one, that's a downward sloping line, y-intercept one. And x over two minus one, that's a positively sloped line, uh, hit the y-axis at negative one. So here you can see in the picture, again, they're trying to do a 3D representation here. Here is our uh, downward sloping line. We're crossing at one and going downhill. And then the other one, we are crossing at the y-axis at negative one, and we are positively sloped. So again, the red and blue line would be flat upon your desk. And then growing up out of that flat desk, we will have, in this case, triangles coming up. So what we need to do here in this case, we need to find the length of the base of one of our triangles. Length of base. And again, this is going to be the base of our triangle. So it's actually this right here that I'm highlighting in blue. We need the length of that rectangle or what's touching one side of it minus what touches the other side of it. So let's see, let's do this one first. We've got this one minus x squared. That is gonna be one minus, or x squared, x over two. One minus x over two. And then we're going to minus what touches the other side. That is the negative one plus x over two. And now let's condense that down with a little algebra into one uh, function. So if we distribute this negative, that's going to turn to a plus 1, and we've already got a 1, so that's a 2. And we've got, this is going to distribute to another negative x over 2. So we've got a negative x over 2 and another of them. We've got two x over 2s that are negative, so that's just going to be minus x. So here is the length of our base. Uh, and in this case, again, we're going to be growing triangles up out of it. But this is a critical piece of the puzzle. The length of the base is 2 minus x. Um, ooh, and it says here the cross sections are equilateral triangles. So we're also going to need to either think back to geometry or look in the cover of our calc book. We are going to need the equation for an equilateral triangle's area area of equilateral triangle. The formula for that in the cover of your book is root 3 over 4 times the base of that triangle squared. 
So we've got the length of our base and we've got the area of the specific geometric shape that we want. So we can now put this into our integral. And let me get this out of here. So now remember I said these the formulas were deceptively simple. You know we had our integral from a to b of a of x dx. Well now we're just going to plug this stuff in there. Um, so let's see. Uh, we've got an integral from 0 to 2. Our function here, a of x, that's going to be our area formula, root 3 over 4, and then we're going to have our base squared, but we've figured out our base is the 2 minus x. Okay, I think I can clear some of this out of here. And I should have a dx on the end of that. I didn't really have room since it was stuck over here. dx. All right, it looks like we are ready to anti-derive this one. And uh, the 2 minus x quantity squared, we could FOIL that out, or we could uh, anti-derive this with a u substitution. And it looks like what I'm going to do first, I'm going to drag that root 3 over 4 out. Ooh, I'm going to give myself a little more room there root 3 over 4 has come out, 0 to 2. And now we've got 2 minus x quantity squared dx. So if we're going to do a u sub, here's our inner function. What is the derivative of the stuff in the parenthesis? That would be a negative 1 dx. So we do need a negative 1 dx. I'm going to put a negative here. And we're going to balance that with a negative out front. And that should be good. So now we can just do a u sub. Uh, let's see here, negative root of 3 over 4. We've got this quantity squared, so we're going to up that to the third power. We're going to divide by 3, and we will evaluate that with the fundamental theorem from 0 to 2. So let's see, we'll save that negative root 3 over 4 till the very, very end. See what happens when the upper limit jumps in. Ooh, look at that. 2 minus 2 is 0. 0 cubed is 0 over 3 is 0, so that's a 0. And then we're going to minus when the lower limit jumps in. Now remember, keep this as a quantity just in case. So when the 0 jumps in there, we get 2 minus 0, and that is to the third power, so that's 8 thirds. And then let's see here, 0 minus 8 thirds. We could just say that's a negative 8 thirds. And then when we multiply those together, get over there. So now these are multiplied together. We're going to have negative times negative is positive. We're going to have an 8 times a root of 3. 8 times a root of 3. And then downstairs, we're going to have a 12. 12. Uh, if you notice the 8 and the 4, or the 8 and the 12, they're both divisible by 4. So we could divide top and bottom by 4. So that's 2 root 3 over 3. Okay. And if that one's a little confusing, in the book we're only doing one example. I have some odd problems where we'll find one base and do multiple uh, volumes based on different geometric shapes. So we're going to do a bunch of more of those in class. Okay. Grand finale here. This is the, uh, the last example. Uh, an application of geometry. Here is, it's kind of a peek into Calc 3 and how the formulas for different volumes were derived to begin with. Now you're going to notice in this one too, it's kept very abstract. Uh, the setup says prove that the volume of a pyramid with a square base is, volume is one-third, height times capital B, where height is the height of the pyramid, B is the area of the base. And I want to do a whole bunch of stuff with these pictures, so I'm going to make a new slide and drop our graph or pictures on there. There we go. So the one on top is a three-dimensional representation. The one on the bottom is a cross-section. Uh, and now what we're dealing with here, we have similar triangles. 
similar triangles. So think back to uh, geometry, similar triangles have all the same angles, but the sides will be a little different in shape, but we can set up proportions between them. So let's label a few things here on these pictures. Down here, this big, I'm going to use red ink, the base of our uh, rectangle here, we'll call that a uh, lowercase b, that's the length of that one side. And notice we've got this sort of platform, I'm going to highlight it in red, working its way up. Uh, let's call this base here b prime. So that is our cross section, uh, looks like a square in there. So b and b prime. And now let's go down to the figure below. So across the bottom here, since we cut that off, this is going to be half of b. That's supposed to be a one half. One half b. Um, this overall height here, let's call that ca or, uh, lowercase h. And then down here, this part, let's call this y. That's our distance that this platform is above. Oop, and I guess we could call this here one half b prime. B prime. So what's this little gap left up here? Well, if the overall height is h and this is y, this has to be h minus y. There we go. So again, what we have here are similar triangles. And let me do this. I'm going to slide this over here. There we go. And we can, since they are similar triangles, we can set up a proportion. Now I'm going to set up my first fraction like this. B prime is to B as we want to figure out what's going on the other side here. So B prime is to B. And that is, you know, B prime over B. We could say that is the uh, side of this little platform I'm hitting here in the black ink. And then the big B is the side of the big base of the triangle. So let's relate that to the heights. What's related to the height of the big base? Well, that would be this H, the overall base of the pyramid, the overall height of the pyramid. So those are going to go straight across from each other. What we have up here is the base of this platform, this cross section as it works its way up. So what's the height above that? Well, that would be this part right here I'm hitting in black ink, H minus Y that quantity h minus y. Okay, now let's isolate this b prime. Remember that is, let me, I'm, my pictures are getting so covered here. This right here I'm hitting in red ink, that is our b prime. The side of one of, uh, one of our sides of that sort of platform, that cross section. So if we get that b prime by itself, that's as easy as multiplying both sides by b. So I would write that as b over h times uh, h minus y. There we go. Now remember, if I back up that here, uh, capital B is the area of the base. And what we've just found here, whoop, wrong way. What we've just found here is one of the sides. So if I want to turn that into the area of the base, I'm going to have to square it. So I would square this side, b prime squared, and now I'm just going to square everything on the other side. So the area of that platform is going to be b squared over h squared times quantity h minus y squared. Uh, and when we integrate this, uh, notice down here, our uh, representative rectangle is perpendicular to the y-axis. We're going to integrate this from lower limit 0, upper limit h. Oops, that wasn't supposed to happen. So we're going to integrate from 0 to h. Volume equals, we're going to integrate starting at 0, going all the way up to h, and then we're going to have that a of y dy. So that's going to be that formula we just found, b squared over h squared, h minus y quantity squared, dy. And a big thing to keep in mind here, remember b and h are s numbers that are set in stone depending on what uh, size pyramid we're working with. The only real variable up here is this y. So I'm going to highlight that in red. Keep that in mind as we're integrating this. Uh, let's do a u sub. So here is our u, some number, minus y. What's the derivative of that? Well, the number would derive away. The minus y would derive to a negative dy. 
So we are going to need a negative dy. I'll put a red or a blue negative there. And of course, we'll balance that in front of our integral symbol also with a negative. Uh, the b squared over h squared, we could pull that out since it is just a number, or we could just leave it attached. It's just some other constant. Uh, so we're not going to worry too much about it. So let's anti-derive. The negative comes along. The b squared over h squared is going to be there because that's just a number. Now here's our inner function. So let's raise that power by 1. It's up to cubed. We're going to divide by the new power cubed. We are going to evaluate that from 0 up to h. Again, lots of variables in there. b's and h's and y's. Oh my. So, I'll switch to red. H is going to jump in. So the first part, we're going to have B, or negative, B squared over H squared, times, when H jumps in here, we're going to have H minus H. So that's going to be 0 cubed over 0. And when we're multiplying by 0, this entire term just gets zeroed out. It's gone. Fundamental theorem says we are going to subtract... And now we've got another term. Careful, we still got this negative here. So that's going to be inside the bracket. And we're going to have a b squared over h squared. That's supposed to be a 2. There we go. Now when 0 jumps in for y, we're going to have h minus 0 quantity cubed. So that's going to be h cubed over 3. Oh, let me get rid of this. There we go. So we still got that negative outside that bracket there. So of course we're going to multiply negative times negative is positive. And let's see what happens if we multiply straight across. So we have upstairs a b squared times an h cubed. Downstairs we have an h squared and a 3. Well because we have those h's uh, we can simplify. We can subtract exponents. Ooh, notice here this 3 is in the denominator. Let's kind of pull that out, make it a fraction. So we have a 1 third. And then we have this b squared. And then h cubed over h is just h. 1 third base times height. Um, and again, if we want to jive that to this formula up here that they started us with, just remember they defined capital B as the area of the base. So down here, this B times B, that would be side times side, so that would be the area. We can turn that B squared into a capital B. One third area of the base times the height of the pyramid. There we go. It's really neat to see that happen. There won't be anything like that on a test or even in the homework, but it's neat to see where these formulas originally came from. I'll never forget seeing the volume of a sphere as we created that in Calc 3. All right, that is the end of a very uh, juicy video here. I'll see you in class, and we'll work on some odd problems.